Hi guys, and welcome back to Let's Make a Redstone Computer. In the last episode, we finished the main part of the computer and the instruction set. But even with all this hardware and software, everything is still very contained. The computer is basically just a box that changes its memory. So today, we're going to talk about input and output. I hope you enjoy. Just like everything else in this series, input and output introduces a ton of freedom. There are unlimited ways to connect a computer to the outside world. But even with all this freedom, most approaches can fit into two main categories, port-based I.O. and memory-mapped I.O. Let's talk about port-based I.O. first. This approach, also known as isolated I.O., is where you use ports to talk to external devices. A port is basically just another register, and you can think of it as separate from the main CPU. In general, you can have as many ports as you want, but to keep things simple for this example, let's say you have four ports. Now if you want to send some data to the outside world, just write it to a port. You can write a 7 to port 1, or a 3 to port 2, whatever you want. Then the devices on the outside can read the ports to access the data. For example, maybe one of your devices is a number display. In that case, you could just have it read port 1 and display the 7. And if a device wants to send data to the CPU, like with a controller, just do the reverse. Have the device write the data to a port, and now the CPU can read it. This approach is nice because the ports are a physical, intermediate layer between the CPU and the devices. The CPU can see the ports, but it can't talk to the devices directly. And the devices can see the ports, but can't talk to the CPU directly. But the downside of this approach is that you need extra instructions to talk to the ports. For example, if we added ports to our computer, we would probably need at least one more instruction. Maybe an instruction called port, that takes in a register, a port address, and a bit to signify if you're loading from the port or storing to the port. Another idea is to have two instructions, port load and port store. This works too. The point is, since ports are a separate piece of hardware, the instruction set needs separate instructions to talk to them, or at the very least, a separate argument within an existing instruction. Now let's talk about the other category, memory mapped I.O. The idea behind memory mapping is to use the memory already in the CPU to directly talk to devices. For example, let's say you have a number display. Specifically, it takes in an 8-bit number and shows it on these three digits. To connect this to the CPU using memory mapping, you can take an address from data memory, like address 255, and directly plug it in. Whatever is at that address will now show up on this display. For example, if you store a 13 to address 255 using this program, the device shows 13. We've basically hijacked this address. As another example, let's say you have an 8x8 screen. It takes in any 8x8 pattern in the back and shows it on these pixels. You could hook this up to the computer by taking the last 8 addresses of data memory, 248 to 255, and plugging them in. Each column of the screen is now showing the data from each address. For example, if you store 1 through 8 using this program, you can literally see the data. Or if you store these numbers using this program, you'll get a smiley face. Memory mapping is nice because you don't need to change the instruction set whatsoever. Assuming the devices are directly connected to data memory, you can just use load and store. But the downside is that it takes up space in memory. In this case with the screen, these 8 addresses are essentially reserved. You can't use them for anything other than the screen, because if you do, it'll mess up what's on the screen. So which strategy should we use? Should we create ports? Should we use memory mapping? Or should we do something else? Well, when I made this computer the first time, I thought about this a lot, and I eventually decided to use memory mapping. So that's what we're going to make in this series. If you're making your own computer, this might not be the best choice for you. Make sure to consider ports as well, because that might be better for your situation. But yeah, for our computer, we're going to create a memory mapped system. Specifically, we're going to reserve the last 16 addresses of data memory, 240 to 255, for input and output. One cool thing about having 16 is that you can easily access all of them using offsets. Remember from last episode that the offset value for loads and stores is negative 8 to 7. So if you use 248 as a pointer, then offset negative 8 will reach 240, all the way to offset 7 reaches 255. Then in terms of devices, we're going to add 5. A controller, a random number generator, a number display, a character display, and a giant 32x32 32 32 screen. I just picked these devices because they seemed useful for making games. To connect these devices to the computer, we need to create a protocol, or a system of rules so that everything knows how to talk to each other. The protocol is something that you, as the designer, need to come up with. There's really no right or wrong way to make a protocol. All that matters is that it makes sense to you. For our protocol, we're going to keep track of it with another spreadsheet. There are 16 rows, one for each address, and they're color-coded according to the devices. This column shows the devices, and this column shows the address. 
Then there's a column called functionality, which I need to explain. As I've described memory mapping so far, the CPU can both store to an address and load from an address as normal. But in reality, this is pretty difficult to wire. So we're actually gonna make each address either store only, where the CPU can only output data to it, or load only, where the CPU can only read the data as input. And so that's what this column is for. It'll just tell you which addresses are store only and which are load only. Then there's the name, which is pretty self-explanatory. There's a holds column to describe what this address is supposed to hold. And then the last two columns describe what happens on a store and what happens on a load. If this doesn't all make sense right now, I think it'll be a little more clear when we start to fill it in. So first, let's make the controller. Since this computer is meant for games, let's make the controller have a D-pad for up, left, down, and right, and four buttons for A, B, start, and select. I'll combine these signals into an 8-bit wire. 8 bits is the perfect amount for just one address, so let's reserve address 255 for the controller, and I'll just plug these 8 bits directly into that address. So now, if you load from 255, the 8 bits you get signify which things on the controller are being pressed. If you load and get this string, for example, then you know that up and left are being pressed. On the spreadsheet, let's label address 255 as load only, the name is controller input, and it holds the controller info. And on a load, it simply loads that controller info. It doesn't do anything on a store because it's load only. If you try to store to it, that store will go nowhere. One problem with this though, is that a button press is very short, meaning when you load, it can be difficult to actually capture it. So I'm gonna plug these four buttons into some SR latches before they reach the address. That way when you press a button, it stays on. Once there's a load from 255, this wire will reset the latches. This makes it much easier to capture button presses from the player. Trust me, you'll have a very hard time without it. Next, let's add a random number generator. I chose to add this because randomness is a huge part of making games. In Tetris, you want a random piece. In Snake, you want a random apple. You get the idea. In Minecraft, one of the easiest ways to generate randomness is with a binary randomizer. This circuit will give a random 1 or 0 when I press this button. It's a 50-50 chance. So if you have 8 of them, it'll create a random 8-bit number. However, these randomizers use droppers and hoppers, which are usually fine, but in the next episode, we're going to use a special tool to speed up the game, and that tool does not support these blocks. So I'm going to use this circuit to create randomness instead. This is called a linear feedback shift register. It's 8 bits tall, so when I press this button, a random 8-bit number is generated. The details of this circuit are not important for this video, but the idea is that using a shift register and some XOR gates, you can generate decently good randomness. And those components are easily created with your basic dust, repeaters, and comparators. No special blocks required. So let's connect this circuit directly to address 254, just like the controller on address 255. Now when you load from 254, this wire will generate a random number, and you'll receive it on the load. So on the spreadsheet, address 254 is load only again, the name is RNG, it holds a random 8-bit number, and on a load, it loads that random 8-bit number. Next up, the number display. This is similar to the device I was showing earlier. It takes in any 8-bit number and displays it. But it also has another input to switch between sign mode and unsigned mode. For example, if you input this and it's on unsigned mode, it'll show 203. But if it's on signed mode, it'll interpret it using 2's complement and show negative 53. This device also has a switch to clear the number. When you flick this lever, it forces all the lamps to be off. So I'm going to reserve these four addresses for the number display, 250 to 253, and all four of them will be store only. The CPU can store data to them, but can't load the data back. Address 250 will be for storing the number you want to show, and therefore the contents of address 250 will be directly connected to the display. For example, if you store a 7 to address 250, the display will show 7. Now, not all programs will need to use this display. Sometimes it's just better to have it turned off. So I'm going to use address 251 as a way to turn off the number display. If you store anything to address 251, it will detect that store and turn off the display. Notice that the holds column for this address is empty, because the contents don't matter. I'm just using this address for the store signal. Similarly, I'm going to use the store signal of address 252 and 253 to switch between sign mode and unsigned mode. If you store anything to 252, it'll switch to sign mode, and if you store anything to 253, it'll switch to unsigned mode. Here's an example program to hopefully make this more clear. It starts by storing a 200 to address 250, so the display shows 200. 
Then it increments to 200 and stores to 250 again, so the display updates to 201. Then there's a store to 252, which changes it to sign mode, so the display updates to negative 55. Another store to 253, which changes it back to unsigned mode. A store to 251, which clears the display, and then an increment and another store to 250, so it turns back on and shows 202. Okay, but this is an annoying program to read, right? You basically have to memorize the protocol to understand what's going on. So I'm going to add something called definitions to the assembler. That way the programmer can make things more clear. A definition is just a way to represent a number with a word. In my assembly language, if you say define apple 3, then every time you write apple, it'll be replaced with a 3. So to clean this up, let's define the word base pointer as 248, and let's define the names of the four ports as the four offsets. Now when you put these definitions into the program, it's much easier to read, and it assembles to the exact same thing. Next is the character display. In a typical character display, the characters show up one by one as you type them. And that's fine for most things, but when it comes to games, it would be nice to write a message instantaneously. So this character display is special. When you send characters to it, they don't get written to the screen. Instead, they get written to a secret buffer behind the screen, which the player can't see. Then when you want to display it, you can press this button to copy the buffer to the screen, making the entire message appear at once. For example, let's write the message subscribe. As you can see, it's not on the screen, it's in the buffer. It's only visible once you press this button to push the buffer. Now there's also a button to clear the buffer, so if you want to display a new message, you can do the following. Clear the buffer, write the new message, and push the buffer again. The screen will immediately update to the new message. And if you ever want to clear the display completely, just clear the buffer and push it. On the spreadsheet, there will be three addresses for the character display, 247 to 249, and they're all store only. Address 247 will hold the 8-bit code for the character, and on a store, it'll write the character to the buffer. Now, the types of characters you can write depends on what character set you're using. For our computer, I just made this simple character set with 30 characters. You can use a different character set if you're making your own computer. And to make programming easier, I made some inbuilt definitions for them in the assembler. If you type a single character and wrap it in quotes, it'll automatically assemble to that character code. LDI R1 quote A will put the code for A into register 1. Then address 248 will be for pushing the buffer, and address 249 will be for clearing the buffer. Let's go ahead and make a program to write something. I'll write the message hello. First grab 247 for the pointer, then load H into register 1, and store it. Do the same thing for E, L, L, and O, and then store to 248 to push the buffer. Last but not least, let's add the screen. This screen has an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, a draw pixel button, and a clear pixel button. And just like the character display, the draws and clears are done in a buffer, not the actual screen. For example, if you input 2, 3, and press draw, it'll turn on that pixel at that coordinate in the buffer. And then just like before, there's a signal to push the buffer and a signal to clear the buffer. If you push it right now, you'll see the pixel we wrote at 2, 3. Then if you clear the buffer and push it again, the screen gets cleared. So the screen will reserve seven memory addresses, 240 to 246. And this time they're not all store only. I'll get to that in a second. Addresses 240 and 241 are to hold an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. And since the coordinates are five bits each, only the bottom five bits will be plugged in. Then address 242 will use the right signal to draw a pixel in the buffer. And address 243 will use the right signal to clear a pixel in the buffer. Then address 245 will push the buffer, and address 246 will clear the buffer. Let's look at a quick example. This program stores 2 for x and 3 for y into the coordinates. Then it stores to draw pixel, which will draw the pixel at 2, 3 in the buffer. Then it pushes the buffer, then it updates y to 4 and draws that pixel. Then it pushes the buffer again, and finally it clears the buffer and pushes it again. The only other address, 244, you'll notice is load only. That's because it's an input. We're going to take the pixel at these coordinates from the screen buffer and plug it back into the bottom bit of this address. For example, if these are the current coordinates and the buffer looks like this, then when you load address 244, the bottom bit will be on. It might seem weird to do this, but reading pixel values is super useful, especially when making games. If you're making Tetris, for example, it's nice to read the pixels underneath the piece, because if they're on, the piece hit the ground. Another way to think about this is that the screen buffer has now become another piece of memory for the computer. 
you can write data to it or read from it. So what makes it different from any other piece of memory? And with that, the protocol is done and all the devices are hooked up. I know I went over a lot in this video, but I want to stress once again that this protocol is just how I personally designed it. There are many other ways to do this. And on top of that, there are many different devices and features you could potentially add. You could add a sprite drawer to the screen, you could add a keyboard, you could even connect another computer. Why not? As long as the protocol makes sense to you and the devices know how to use it, you're good to go. Our computer is just one example of a working system. If you want more examples, then check out the links in the description, especially the top link for Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. Brilliant is a platform to learn all things math, data analysis, programming, and AI. Just like Redstone, they make learning fun. The lessons are filled with hands-on activities, which are both more engaging and more beneficial than just watching a video. Whether you're a student or someone who just wants to learn in their free time, Brilliant makes it easy. The lessons are available 24-7. Recently, I did a lesson on a case study for Airbnb, and it actually gave me a lot more insight for how to visualize real data sets. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash mapbatwings or scan the QR code on screen, or you can click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription.